Colorado, Denver, Stapleton Airport, July 19th, 1989. Known as the gateway to the Rockies, Denver is the starting point for journeys all over the U.S. 1,300 planes take off from here every day, carrying over 75,000 passengers. It's the peak of the summer season, and Stapleton is packed with vacationers and business travelers. Debbie McKelvey will be among the vacationers flying from Stapleton today. She's taking her children, Devon, age six, and her son Ryan, who's seven, to a family reunion back in her home state of Pennsylvania. I was going home for two weeks uh, with my children, and I was very, very excited about the trip. Debbie is taking advantage of United Airlines' Children's Day promotion. Today, kids under 14 can fly for one cent. But each must fly with a paying adult. Debbie pairs up with a tennis club girlfriend, Ruth Ness, so she can sit with one of the kids. It was nice having Ruth with me because she entertained one child while I was entertaining the other child. 1.15 p.m. Debbie, Ruth, and the kids wait to board flight UA-232 to Philadelphia via Chicago. Commanding the flight is Captain Alfred C. Haynes. His cabin staff reported a minor electrical fault in the galley on the previous leg, but engineers have given it the all clear. Captain Haynes is a veteran pilot with 7,190 hours logged in the DC-10. The passengers will be in safe hands today. The DC-10 is a great airplane to fly. It's, I think I was termed an old man's airplane because it's so simple to fly. At this time in the late 1980s, there are over 400 DC-10s in service. But it's a plane with a troubled history. Windsor, Ontario, 1972. A cargo door blows out on a year-old DC-10, causing severe decompression. The pilots manage to land the plane safely. Two years later, a door comes off a Turkish Airlines DC-10 flying out of Paris. This time, the violent decompression tears the plane apart in midair. All 346 people on board die. McDonnell Douglas finds the fault and fixes it. But the reputation of the DC-10 never fully recovers. The DC-10 making flight 232 today is in its 17th year of service and has flown over 43,000 hours. So far, without incident. Today should be no different. Jerry Schemmel is deputy commissioner of the Continental Basketball Association and a frequent flyer. I was never a nervous flyer. I, I always kind of enjoyed flying. I took my first flight at age 18. I always enjoyed it. Jerry is flying to Columbus on business with his boss and great friend, Jay Ramsdell. Their original flight is canceled, but Jay gets a seat on the very next flight. The bad news is, there's no seat for Jerry. Jay decides to stay with his buddy and wait for an even later plane. I, I didn't think much of it at that time. I thought it was a nice gesture. I thought to myself, I, I hope I would have done the same thing. Finally, after a six and a half hour wait, Jerry and Jay both get seats on flight UA-232 to Philadelphia. Flight 232 is busy today. It's carrying 285 passengers and 11 crew. Debbie McKelvey boards with her friend and two kids. They add to an unusually high number of children on board, 52 in total, thanks to the Children's Day deal. For senior flight attendant, Jam Brown Law, lots of children on board means a busy flight ahead. 
After a four-day trip, Jan is excited to be heading home to Chicago. I just remember feeling just the energy of, of this last leg and getting all pumped up to do the service. Captain Haynes, co-pilot Bill Records, and flight engineer Dudley Dvorak run through their pre-flight checks. They taxi out to the runway and await the takeoff clearance. At 2.09 p.m., the three-engine jet flies out of Denver. The morning we left Denver, it was clear skies, beautiful day, nice smooth air, comfortable flight, just a routine flight. Debbie McKelvey sits with her son Ryan while her friend Ruth is one row behind, looking after her daughter Devon. At 3.16 p.m., they're finishing their meal. Suddenly, out of the blue, a terrifying blast rips through the plane. The first thing I thought was a bomb has gone off. I really did. I thought someone had planted a bomb, it had been detonated, and we started to drop. The only way I can think to explain it, it's like if you're driving down a highway and you hit a pothole. Jam Brown Law fears it may be a breach in the plane's fuselage. I instinctively sat down on the floor and held on, not knowing if it were a decompression, that everything that isn't tied down securely is going to be sucked out. There's no sign of any visible damage inside the plane. But up in the cockpit, Captain Haynes scans the engine instruments and quickly realizes that his number two engine is malfunctioning. I've never had a jet engine fail in flight. Only in the flight simulator, never in flight. But this time, it's happening for real. 3.17 p.m. Captain Haynes' priority is to shut down the problem engine. He's not too worried the DC-10 can fly comfortably on its remaining two wing-mounted engines. Haynes follows the shutdown procedure and cuts off fuel and power to the number two engine. The problem engine is off, but now flight engineer Dudley Dvorak spots something else wrong. Oh, we've lost our hydraulic quantity. His instruments tell him that all three of the plane's hydraulic systems are empty. He cannot believe his eyes. The hydraulic systems operate the plane's flaps, ailerons, rudder, and elevator. Without these controls, the pilots won't be able to steer the plane or take it up or down. But the instruments are right. Al, can you help me out with this? Co-pilot Bill Records is horrified to find his flight controls are no longer responding. The plane starts to bank steeply to the right, and he's powerless to stop it. That's when we realized we, we were in a world of hurt, that uh, something was drastically wrong. Now Captain Haynes tries the flight controls, but he cannot get the DC-10 back into level flight either. The plane is now trying to roll over a terrifying prospect. We have nothing to turn the airplane, nothing to control the pitch of the aircraft. Why the aircraft? It's every pilot's nightmare. Flight 232 is at 11,000 meters and out of control. If its left wing continues to lift, the plane will flip over and tumble to its doom. United Airlines Flight 232 is down to two engines. Worse still, the plane has lost all conventional flight controls. Despite everything that Captain Haynes tries, the plane seems bent on turning over. Back in the cabin, the passengers feel the plane banking steeply. Now, my son at seven and a half, he had always been a people watcher. And he looked around and he said, something's not right here. You could feel the turn. You could feel the, the sensation physically of your body leaning off to the right side. I remember feeling that, thinking that was very unusual. 3.18 PM. The left wing is so high that the plane is in an extremely steep bank. Al Haynes knows that within a few more seconds, it will roll over and tumble out of control. There is just one old aviator's trick left to him. 
If it fails, Flight 232 is doomed. The first reaction was to just close one throttle and push the other one up, see if maybe that would help. In a desperate bid to restore level flight, Haynes tries adjusting the relative power of the two wing engines. If the right engine runs faster, the airplane will bank left and vice versa. It works. Captain Haynes is able to pull the plane out of its roll. He still has no flight controls, but he regains a crude form of steering by using the throttles. But Haynes finds that he can only make right-hand turns. 3.20 p.m. Co-pilot Bill Records radios Minneapolis Air Route Traffic Center. Control Center. Now you're Shut down engine. He reports the loss of flight controls and requests a flight path to the nearest airport. The pilots have no idea how they're going to land the crippled plane. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the captain. We've shut down the number two engine. Now Captain Haynes tells passengers that one engine has failed, but he doesn't mention the loss of flight controls. Not all the passengers find his words reassuring. You could just feel a tenseness in the flight attendants. And that's when you kind of felt, there's something not right here. Captain Haynes knows that time is running out. UA-232 is dropping at around 250 meters per minute. They need to attempt an emergency landing soon before they lose height altogether. 322. Air traffic control informs the flight crew that their nearest runway is at Sioux Gateway. This is a small regional airport near the sleepy town of Sioux City, Iowa. 325 p.m. A quiet afternoon in a Sioux City fire station is about to get a whole lot busier. When Fire Chief Robert Hamilton hears an alert called in, he suspects something big. I've been in this business a long time, and you can kind of tell. Uh, you have almost a sixth sense, I guess. Within minutes, the fire chief's hunch is proved correct. UA-232 is heading right for his city. Nine fire trucks race out to their emergency positions on one of the runways. Now Captain Haynes and his crew have to work out how they're going to land the plane with barely any controls. Before they can make a plan, they hit another problem. The DC-10 starts to soar up and then down in a random, uncontrollable cycle. For the pilots, it's like riding a roller coaster through the sky. We had no idea how long we're going to keep that airplane in the sky. Debbie McKelvey feels the plane's erratic motion and fears for her life. Here I have a six-year-old and a seven-year-old. You start praying, you know, if I'm going to die, please make sure we all go and we all go quick. 3.26 p.m. Captain Haynes calls his senior flight attendant up to the cockpit. When I open that door, the whole atmosphere hit me. It's the worst crisis possible. The captain tells Jan to prepare the cabin for an emergency landing. As I walk through the first class cabin, I just could not look anybody in the eye because I was afraid they'd, they'd read the fear in mine. Denny Fitch is a DC-10 training pilot flying home from an instructor session. He knows that something is wrong and offers his help. 329. What Denny finds in the cockpit shocks him. It was an amazing scene for me because both the pilots were in fact on the controls. Both of them, their tendons and their forearms were raised from effort. Their knuckles were white from grip. As an expert training pilot, Denny Fitch is ready for any emergency, but he's never seen anything like this before. I was dumbfounded because it was unheard of. As a matter of fact, there was no procedure for having no hydraulics. The first thought that came to my mind to be honest, was that I was going to die that afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, Captain Haynes now tells his passengers the plane is damaged and they'll be making an emergency landing in Sioux City. Landing's a little different than you're used to. 296 people could lose their lives. Getting this airplane down without crashing will be the ultimate test of pilot skill. 
Denny offers to help out any way he can. I said, Captain, would you want me to do your throttles? And he responded, yes, do that. Denny takes over on the throttles, the only controls still functioning. They allow him some degree of steering, but the plane is still only able to make right-hand turns. As far as I'm concerned, he's now the fourth member of the crew because he was willing to step in there and, and help us any way he could. 348. The DC-10 is now 12 minutes from Sioux City Airport and they're running out of altitude. It's time for the pilots to face an almost unthinkable prospect. In a few minutes, they must attempt to land a 165-ton jet without proper flight controls. The lives of 285 passengers are in their hands. The pilots must now try to line up for the final approach into Sioux City Airport. Denny Fitch will attempt to steer the plane and control its descent, all by adjusting the throttles. What's more, the plane can only make right-hand turns. The plan is to make a series of looping turns and hope that as they come out of their final circuit, they're facing the runway. The odds are stacked against them. At 3.50 p.m., senior flight attendant Jan Brown Law begins her final safety briefing. The passengers were right there in the palm of our hand. There, you could have heard a pin drop. Jan pays special attention to the four children, too small to have their own seats. You need to put your seatbelt on the Official guidelines are non-specific, but United Airlines procedure at the time is for adults to hold these lap children on the floor during an emergency landing. Jan is anxious about the procedure, but has no option but to follow protocol. It makes my skin crawl to this day to think that I found myself telling passengers, parents of lap children, to put their child on the floor and hold them down. As the flight crew near Sioux City, they are only too aware of what's at stake. You've got 296 lives in your two hands. You literally do. And I've, I've never felt so overwhelmingly, you know, responsible for anything in my life. With no brakes, the DC-10 will need a long runway. Air traffic control assigns them runway 31. At 2,700 meters, it's the longest at Sioux City. 3.52 p.m. Denny Fitch puts the plane into its final looping turn. He knows the crippled jet would never be able to regain altitude for a second attempt. This was it. We had to land on that runway. One time, that's all we had. As they emerge from their final loop, the pilots see a wonderful sight. Sioux City Airport, dead ahead. There's just one problem. It's the wrong runway. Here we are, there's a runway right in front of us. We're out of time, we're out of altitude. That's where we're gonna go. Runway 22 is much shorter than runway 31. And it's full of fire trucks and ambulances. It wasn't until probably a couple of minutes uh, at the most that we had a change in that, that the runway was actually shifted then from 1331 uh, to runway 22. 359. Fire trucks race out of the path of the plunging DC-10. And so we were basically just kind of scrambling, getting out of the way, if you will, and trying to get to an ideal position for that particular runway. Captain Haynes orders the passengers into the brace position. Brace, brace, brace. The minute we said brace, it was like a breeze going over a field of wheat. Everybody in the cabin disappeared from sight to go into their brace position. I'd have thinking, you know, this is it. And I actually made my son shut the window uh, shade. And I thought, we don't need to see, you know, the end as it's coming. As the pilots desperately try to line up the airplane with the runway, 
they realize they're still coming in at 400 kilometers per hour, around 150 kilometers per hour faster than normal. But with no control of the flaps, they cannot slow the descent. The alarm sounds from the ground proximity warning system. They're descending too rapidly. The plane is plunging at 560 meters per minute, over six times the normal rate. Down on the ground, a local news crew races into position to cover the crash landing. Not gonna be pretty. 4 p.m. Just seconds from landing, the nose and right wing drop. If they come in at this angle, the plane could break apart. And they shoved both the throttles to maximum power, hoping that that, res that would result in the nose being pulled up. Denny Fitch desperately struggles to bring the nose back up, but it's too late. The engines don't respond in time. 4 p.m. and 16 seconds, the plane smashes into the runway. It just felt like we dropped out of the sky and hit the ground. It wasn't like it was an emergency landing. It was, it was a crash. I could hear all the screeching metal, the noises that you never heard before and you hope you never hear again. The right landing gear and wing shear off, spilling fuel and sparking a fire. I could see fireballs because I guess the plane, you know, it's screeching on the runway. And then that was my next thought. Oh my God, we're gonna burn to death. The jet careers along the runway on its wing stump for about 600 meters, then breaks apart. The cockpit had snapped off like a pencil tip and we became a tumbling 200 mile an hour piece of wreckage. The main section of the fuselage skids further down the runway, rolls over on its back, and comes to a halt at the side of the airfield. The plane is split into three main pieces, cockpit, tail section, and middle passenger section. Dozens of surviving passengers flee the burning cabin. Fire trucks and ambulances race to help them. Emergency workers arrive to an horrific scene of dead and injured passengers. Survivors escaping the wreckage scatter through cornfields at the edge of the runway. Debbie and her son Ryan are among them. I grabbed my son and we started running and running. And I had no idea where we are. Some of the children and babies held on the floor before landing are missing. The violence of the crash tore them from their parents' grasp. One grief-stricken mother confronts flight attendant Jan Brown Law. And she just looked up at me and she said, you told me to put him on the floor, that it would be all right. And I thought, I'm going to live with those words for the rest of my life. The child, 23-month-old Evan Zhao, tragically died in the burning jet. In the chaos of the crash, Debbie McKelvey and her son Ryan managed to get out of the wreck. But she can't see six-year-old daughter Devon anywhere. So then you start really thinking, why didn't I have both of them? And, and it's, it's just a horrible, horrible sinking feeling. Jerry Schemmel escaped the cabin unhurt. But now he hears a baby's cries. Despite the choking fumes, he ventures back inside the burning aircraft. I didn't think if I go back in, the thing will explode or I might not find my way back out. I just reacted. I heard the cries of baby and the next thing I know, I'm back inside the aircraft. As the central cabin section burns, it starts to fill with toxic fumes. Smoke like this can kill in minutes. Parents like Debbie McKelvey fear that their missing children could still be somewhere inside the blazing jet. Flight 232 crashes at Sioux City Airport and lies in a smoking ruin at the edge of the runway. 
survivors flee the crashed airliner, but a baby's cries draw passenger Jerry Schemmel back inside. So I finally got right over top of the crying, and I'm feeling around, and there's a baby stuck inside this overhead bin. I just grabbed the baby with one arm and scooped her out of a hole. I got back on my feet, found the opening, just kind of aimed for the, the, the sunlight, and shot out the plane the second time. Jerry's actions probably saved the baby's life. But Debbie McKelvey is desperate. She fears her daughter and friend have not survived the crash. Then, suddenly, she spots a face. It's her six-year-old daughter, Devon, emerging from the smoke. It was the absolute best feeling because she was there and she was okay. While passengers flee the wreckage, Captain Haynes and the flight crew are trapped in the cockpit. The plane's nose has buried itself into the soft earth beside the runway. It's the last place the rescuers reach. They have to use a forklift and cutting equipment to get through the twisted wreckage. It takes 30 minutes to reach the pilots. At 5 p.m., rescuers pull out all four pilots, seriously injured, but alive. As I remember the pat on my chest and his words to me were, you're okay, buddy, I'm here, I got you, you're gonna be okay. And uh, I felt this tremendous relief. The flaming wreck of UA-232 burns for over two hours. Nine helicopters and 34 ambulances evacuate survivors. Jerry Schemmel's thoughts turn to his buddy, Jay, whom he lost sight of in the crash. Jerry hopes that he might have made it, but as time goes by, he loses all hope. I had a pretty good hunch eight hours after the crash when he didn't show up anywhere that he wasn't uh, a survivor. Jay Ramsdell is one of 111 passengers who lose their lives in the crash. One flight attendant is also killed. Eleven children are among the dead. Remarkably, 184 people survived the Sioux City crash. But for the pilots of Flight 232, any number of deaths is a tragedy. Training pilot Denny Fitch learns how many died when his wife visits him in hospital. And she started crying because she realized I didn't know the truth. That in fact, 112 people had died behind me. And, she, and I saw her cry, I had my answer. And I cried every waking moment for the next three days. I just couldn't stop crying. It, it just so tore my heart out to know that people died behind me. I was ready to die for them and I didn't want them to die. Al Haynes and the flight crew are determined that something positive should come out of the tragedy. I would like to say that this crew and in fact the entire industry is dedicated to finding the cause of this accident. So maybe we can never have it happen again. The National Transportation Safety Board, or NTSB, dispatches an investigation team to Sioux City. With 427 DC-10s still in service all around the world, they need to find out what happened to the plane, and quickly. Frank Hildrup leads the team, analyzing the aircraft structure. There's a lot of apprehension and anxiety, of course, that we always go into these things with, and uh, I was fairly new at the time. I had not been with the agency, but for about nine months. Hildrup and the NTSB team arrive in Iowa nine hours after the crash and get straight down to work. The investigator's first priority is to try to recover every piece of the wreckage so that they can reassemble the aircraft. It's a mammoth task. It was such an immense accident scene that we just we just knew we had a long uh, uh, investigation ahead of ourselves. The crash scatters thousands of fragments of debris over a distance of one kilometer. Emergency services and the National Guard mobilize hundreds of personnel. They scour every square meter of land around the runway. The tiniest component might tell them what triggered the crash. As investigator Jim Wildey knows only too well. 
If you want to understand how the airplane came apart, uh, if you want to understand the re interrelationships of various pieces, it is very useful sometimes to put the structure back together. Investigators interview the four pilots to explore the bizarre loss of controls they reported during the flight. Now we've lost all hydraulic pressure. Captain Haynes and the crew confirmed that shortly after the dramatic failure of their number two engine, all their hydraulic systems went down. It mystifies investigator Frank Hildrup. I know personally I wasn't prepared to, for dealing with an airplane crash where it had lost all of its hydraulics. Uh, extremely unique event and uh, something I personally had never encountered before. Hydraulics operate all the flight controls on the DC-10. The flaps that help control descent. The elevators that pitch the plane up and down. The rudder that steers it. The ailerons that make it bank. Pressurized fluid inside hydraulic lines operates these mechanical controls. There are three separate and independent hydraulic systems. Even if one system is breached, it should not cause the loss of hydraulic fluid in the others. To lose fluid from all three systems at once is almost impossible. Experts put the odds at a billion to one. Then, an unexpected find. Farmers, 90 kilometers from Sioux City, report aircraft wreckage scattered on their land. Investigators examine the debris and find that it includes components from the number two hydraulic system in the tail near the failed engine. The team can calculate from the plane's flight path exactly when these parts fell. They discover it happened at 3.16 p.m., the same moment as the loud bang and the engine failure. What the heck? What was that? Everything points to a catastrophic event inside the engine, which then damages the hydraulic systems. They go back to the wrecked plane and examine every millimeter of its hydraulic lines. It's a painstaking process, but it pays off. They find puncture holes in the pressure lines of the plane's other two hydraulic systems, and the holes in both sets of pressure lines are near the failed engine. We determined that all the three hydraulic systems had been breached and that that's why the uh, hydraulic fluid was lost and they lost the ability to really control the airplane. It's incredible, but true. Something did put all three hydraulic systems out of action at exactly the same moment. But the team still has to prove that the number two engine caused the damage. They inspect the puncture holes with a scanning electron microscope and find minute traces of titanium. Titanium is used for critical airplane parts because it's tough, yet very light. On the DC-10, the only titanium anywhere near the tail section is inside the number two engine. And when NTSB engineers reconstruct the DC-10's number two engine, a new clue confirms the team's theory. We learned that uh, a major portion of the number two engine in the tail of the airplane had come apart and was missing. The missing part is the fan disc, the massive central hub of the engine's fan assembly. It's made of titanium. Investigators are starting to get a picture of what caused the bizarre loss of controls aboard flight UA-232. 44 minutes from disaster. The loud bang that crew and passengers hear is the 170 kilogram fan disc fracturing. The broken fan disc bursts through the engine housing. The blast fractures a section of the number two hydraulic system. But in a piece of catastrophic bad luck, fragments also puncture lines in both remaining systems. Zero, all three. I'm sure. They just say zero. 
All hydraulic quantity down. 42 minutes to go. The plane loses all its flight controls. The tail section is so badly damaged that the plane can only make right-hand turns. And without elevators, the pilots cannot keep the plane on a level flight path through the sky. But the NTSB investigators still don't know what caused the fan disc to fracture. Until they find out, more than 200 other DC-10s could be flying around with engines that have a similar hidden fault. They must locate and examine the missing pieces of fan disk. Investigators calculate the likely trajectory of the fan disk debris to find out where it might have landed. They narrow it down to a tract of Iowa corn belt, 36 square kilometers in size. I would consider the search for that fan disk uh, certainly a needle in a haystack type of effort. Investigators pull out all the stops to find the missing fan disk. They scour the area with four helicopters, but find that the three-meter-high corn stalks conceal everything on the ground. They even deploy infrared cameras to try to locate the pieces. But after weeks of searching, they draw a blank. General Electric, the engine manufacturer, offers members of the public a large reward for the missing fan disk. But there's still no sign of it. Two months go by and harvest time comes around. Janice and Dale Sorensen have a 180 hectare farm right in the middle of the search area. Tuesday, October 10th, 1989, and Janice Sorensen is out bringing in the corn. As I was combining, I felt a little resistance on the front of the combine, and I <clears throat> backed it up and then put it in neutral and got out and looked, and I knew immediately that this was the piece they were looking for. It's a massive chunk of debris, half buried in the earth. Teams from General Electric and the NTSB race to the Sorensen farm. Dale and Janice help investigators dig out the piece of wreckage. This is the Sorensen's own video footage of their find. I had a little shovel along and I went and got the tractor or the loader and uh, put a chain around it, hoisted it up, and then we took it down to the turkey shed, which was not very far away, and we had hot water there, so we washed it off, so it was spick and span. Investigators quickly confirm that the debris is a major chunk of the missing fan disk from flight UA-232. Then they find another piece nearby. Together, the two parts complete the entire missing fan disk. Janice Sorensen learns that her find could hold the key to the disaster. I was very emotional about it. I had some tears. It was a combination of the excitement of finding the piece and of the tears for those who'd lost their lives. Uh, one more. Janice and her husband Dale collect General Electric's $120,000 reward. They give over half the money to charity. The NTSB can now begin the next phase of their investigation. They fly the fractured fan disk to the labs of the engine manufacturer General Electric to find out what could break apart such a robust metal component. Jim Wildey, a metallurgist by training, examines the fan disk, starting with the main fracture line where it broke apart. He spots something branching off it, a fatigue crack 13 millimeters long. It's rare to find metal fatigue in a fan disk. These components are specifically designed to withstand the enormous rotational forces within the engine. Then, at the base of the fatigue crack, Wildey 
sees a tiny cavity. The size of it was uh, maximum in any one direction was about 50 thousandths of an inch. As he scans the cavity more closely, he sees that the metal around it looks discolored. He takes a sample from this suspect area for testing. What he discovers will shock the investigation team and rock the aviation industry to its core. Investigator Jim Wildy examines a tiny cavity in the fractured fan disk from flight UA-232. What he finds stuns him. Around the cavity, there is an impurity in the titanium alloy. It's called a hard alpha inclusion, a brittle defect smaller than a fingernail. Analysis reveals that it was caused by excess nitrogen during the forging of the metal ingot. The fan disk in the DC-10 was made from titanium that harbored a fatal hidden defect. It's the final piece of the puzzle. The NTSB team can now put together the chain of events that left the passengers and crew of Flight UA-232 seconds from disaster. As the DC-10's fan disk rotates at 3,800 RPM, the huge stresses initiate a minute crack in the defect. With every flight, it grows fractionally bigger. July 19th, 1989, 44 minutes from disaster. The fan disk has been in service for 15,503 flights over 17 years. The crack reaches 13 millimeters in length. The faulty fan disk can no longer cope with the stresses imposed by its rotation. It shears in two. The damage it causes makes the DC-10 virtually unflyable. For the next 40 minutes, the pilots struggle to control the plane. Five minutes to go. Flight 232 comes out of its final turn into Sioux City. 20 seconds. As the plane comes into land, the right wing drops. Disaster strikes. The right wing tip hits the ground and the DC-10 careers down the runway. A $21 million jet weighing 165 tons is brought down by a tiny metallic floor. For the NTSB investigation team, there's a terrible twist to the tragedy. Investigators discover that United Airlines technicians made a routine inspection of the defective fan disk just 16 months before the crash. They're disturbed. The crack was on the fan disk surface. At the time of the inspection, the crack could have been close to 13 millimeters long. This disk had been inspected before the accident and we determined that the crack was of a detectable size, um, but that it just wasn't detected. The NTSB report concluded that the crack was probably missed due to human error. The report accepted that United Airlines inspection procedures complied with regulations and were up to industry standard, and cited human factors as an industry-wide problem in engine inspection. In the wake of the Sioux City disaster, the Federal Aviation Authority upgraded engine inspection procedures. The FAA also demanded changes to the DC-10's hydraulic systems. Airlines were required to add shut-off valves to limit the amount of fluid that can drain from a breach in hydraulic lines. But today, lab children are still allowed to remain unrestrained during emergency landings. Ever since the crash, 
Jam Brown Law has campaigned for all children to have allocated seats and safety restraints on airplanes. She has never forgotten the young boy, Evan Zhao, who lost his life on her watch. Evan would be 17 years old today had he been in a seat. Denny Fitch, Al Haynes, and the other crew members received industry awards for their extraordinary professionalism and valor. Jerry Schemmel, who now has children of his own, will never forget the debt he owes the pilots. I have thought about those guys every day for 16 years. I don't think we could have been equipped with a better cockpit crew than what we had. The safety measures triggered by the Sioux City crash transformed aviation safety, not just on the DC-10, but on all passenger airliners. The new rules should ensure that such a bizarre and devastating accident can never happen again.